Good evening, Team Kulak community, and welcome back to another episode of Down the Rabbit Hole on the Russia-Ukraine War with uh, Dr. Yuval Weber and myself, Major Ian Brown, Operations Officer at the Kulak Center. Uh, we're here to bring you another update and uh, as well as sort of the latest take on, on what is going to be, you know, a recurring theme that hopefully will have an end at some point, and that is the status of nego or peace negotiations that are going on in between between uh, Ukrainian and Russian representatives, even as the war continues or has moved to a different phase, if you're Russian uh, or has stalled out and is in the process of being pushed back if you're on, if you're Ukrainian. So um, Dr. Weber, good evening, welcome. And we'll let you get us up to speed on where we're at uh, or where the Russians and the Ukrainians are at in peace negotiations. Good evening, Major Brown, as always. Um... So the, the big news, well, there are many pieces of big news since the last time we spoke. Uh, let's also say like in the ether is that uh, President Biden, when describing uh, President Putin, his Russian counterpart the other day, uh, I just wanna make sure I get this quote correct. Uh, and so by the way, so President Biden has called his Russian counterpart, uh, I was taking the notes earlier, a killer, a war criminal, a murderous dictator, a pure thug and a butcher, and said uh, over the weekend, for God's sake, this man cannot remain in power. Which, all things told, the Russians seem to take this in stride. Uh, the Kremlin spokesperson, Dmitry Peskov, said that that's not for Biden to decide. The president of Russia is elected by Russians, which, uh, having observed several elections up close and personal, I can tell you is completely untrue. Uh, but that's just sort of in the air right now. Uh, President Biden said that he didn't mean regime change as U.S. policy, uh, but was just expressing moral outrage. So that's the backdrop over the last couple of days. And also today, uh, the Wall Street Journal and Bellingcat, and Bellingcat obviously being the organization that um, basically broke the story on MH17 when the, uh, the Russian-backed uh, separatist rebels uh, knocked a civilian airliner out of the sky the Alexei Navalny poisoning, the Sergei Skripal poisoning, and several other uh, violations of international treaties uh, revealed that several members of the Ukrainian negotiating team, uh, as well as billionaire entrepreneur uh, Roman Abramovich, um, I guess erstwhile uh, owner of Chelsea Football Club, uh, were poisoned uh, at the beginning of this month as they were uh, negotiating with their Russian counterparts. Um, Apparently, that's just Putin's thing. Uh, I like to drink beer with my friends on the weekend. He likes to poison, poison his uh, rivals at different strokes for different folks. Um, so we have that uh, as well. But one of the reasons that that story was important just for being totally insane in the midst of uh, international diplomacy is that uh, the Ukrainian side denied it, which indicated to those uh, who were following along closely uh, that there was a breakthrough in the peace negotiations today. And the breakthrough in the peace negotiations is that ostensibly, and the word ostensibly is doing a lot of work there, um, the Russians have given up on a number of their core uh, demands as per the beginning of the conflict. So as I remember from the beginning of the conflict, the Russians wanted denazification, which meant basically the change, like total regime change in Ukraine. They wanted neutrality of Ukraine, they wanted the demilitarization of Ukraine, and they want they wanted um, Ukraine to give uh, language protections to Russian language and media, in uh, education, in just daily uh, you know governmental life, and they wanted NATO to cancel itself at the same time. So where it is right now is that uh, the Financial Times spoke to four people with direct uh, knowledge of the negotiations, and apparently. The Russians have dropped denazification, demilitarization, and explicit protections from Russian for the Russian language in their demands upon the Ukrainians. So the two sides would agree to a ceasefire. The Ukrainians would give up on NATO, and that's a that seems to be the core red line uh, for President Putin. But they would be able to seek EU admissions. And what the Ukrainians are putting in is that they would seek uh, external security guarantees. As for uh, Luhansk and Donetsk People's Republics, that would be left to the future in some sort of referendum. 
Crimea left us some sort of future negotiation. The access to uh, uh, the access to water for Crimea, which is on the Ukrainian uh, mainland, um, you know, is something that the Russians wanted to capture. The Ukrainians would basically give the water to uh, Crimea, and additionally, they would agree not to take any land, Crimea, LNR, DNR, uh, take any of that land by force. And so, ostensibly, this is a peace deal that was available to them as of let's say two weeks ago. But they seem to be getting closer and closer because Russia has been unable to make any advances in the field. And that basically the success in the peace negotiations is what led the Ukrainian side to deny that um, there was any poisoning earlier this month. Uh, after even Roman Abramovich, who I don't want to say, uh, so I, I knew a guy who was Abramovich's uh, a press secretary for many years, and I don't know if the guy still works there. But one of the great things about Abramovich is that as a rule, he did not give any comments to the press. And I always said to that guy, you have the world's greatest job. You're the press spokesperson for a person who does not speak to the press. So, but his, his press spokesperson today denied that Abramovich, who had early confirmed that he'd been poisoned, was poisoned. So apparently it's serious enough in the peace negotiations that they didn't want to derail it by any sort of chemical and biological weapons treaty violations. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess that's a good sign, you know, if because poisoning the peace negotiators, any other sort of time or place maybe would be considered probably a uh, fairly unfriendly, if not deliberately escalatory act. Um, it definitely goes beyond party foul. Yeah, yeah, it's you know, you know, there's food poisoning, and then there's, you know, poison poisoning, um, and uh, you can only sort of dismiss one um, as an accident. Um, but that being the but the fact that you know the Ukrainian government is, is and you know uh, the uh, the Russian mediator there are downplaying this. You know, as we mentioned, you talked about before, just seemed to indicate like. There, they at least see that there might be something there that's uh, important, that's that's close enough to go pursue. Um, you know, so so maybe that says something about the the Ukrainian perception. But um, on on the Russian side, uh, aside from poisoning their counterparts, what are what are the chances that this this is in fact potentially sincere from their side? Um, because as we were talking about in the chat here before we sat down. Um, were, were Putin to sort of go along with this, right? It would be a, a huge, um, loss to him as a, as a great power, basically saying that you could play that game when you've, you know, I, I guess if you've been fought to a standstill and you're walking back all the things you went to war for in the first place, great powers don't do that. So, uh, what are the chances on the Russian side that this is in fact a sincere potential offer? Um, or, or what, uh, what else might they be pursuing? Um, if that's not the case that they're sincere with these talks right now. So I'm generally pessimistic, uh, uh, basically the, the, the Russians, maybe two weeks ago or so had not given up on their, um, basically their demilitarization, uh, I guess, uh, negotiating point and now they have. So, in essence, for the reason I'm pessimistic about this is, as you, as you suggested, this would be pretty humiliating relative to pre-war aims. And all the stuff that, let's say, Putin would be able to get from it, which is, let's say, some sort of uh, international status for LNR, DNR, he could have gotten that without everything that's transpired in the field for the last month. So, to the extent that it took however many Russian soldiers, like thousands of dead Russian soldiers to get water access for Crimea. I don't know that that's a great deal. Uh, and particularly if, as you know, the, the Ukrainian side had said that they are not going to, because any, so Zelensky, the Ukrainian president has said that any deal that the negotiators reach that he approves will be put to the Ukrainian people for a referendum. And so the Ukrainian people are, are not going to approve quite literally anything unless the external security guarantees are credible to them in terms of being able to constrain Russian behavior in the future. Because the Ukrainians already had 
the Budapest Memorandum in which their territorial integrity, sovereignty, uh, security was guaranteed by the US, Russia, and the UK, and that obviously did nothing. So if this is going to be a Budapest Memorandum with just a lot more signatures on it, it's not really going to be approved. But then again, anything that in involves external powers guaranteeing Ukraine security against Russia, ostensibly it'd be, you know, mutual, uh, you know, everyone guarantees each other's security. But ostensibly, if the United States is guaranteeing Ukraine security, then that means Putin's ability to be a great power, which the Russian foreign policy elite has long defined as being able to project and project power outside your own borders, being able to shape the politics in your direct region, that would be curtailed. And so for Putin, after 22 years of saying how he's going to make Russia a great power again, this would not be it. And so that's why I am concerned that this is more like a signal to those states which are trying to figure out, like maybe Finland, Sweden, should we join NATO? Maybe other European countries, should we give lethal aid to the Ukrainians? To give them an, basically an argument to say, we don't want to do anything that would upset the Russians at this moment. And that sort of is my, is my concern that this is a plausible deal, but it's not sincere from the Russian side because there's no way that Putin's going to accept um, something that looks like this. So the, that being the case, I want to um, play devil's advocate a little bit. So if, and this is a giant if, right, but if there's a more than a non, you know, a non-zero chance that there's there's any good faith on the Russian side behind this, would that potentially indicate that that huge loss of face, that that impact to their great power status, is it possible that the the damage inflicted on both the Russian military and the Russian economy at this point could it be so so bad that 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 otherwise loss of of great power status and stepping down of war aims might potentially be acceptable because our, you know, we're not, you know, we're seeing pieces of information from the battlefield. The Russian losses look bad, right? Mm -hmm. um, we, but we haven't been able to count every single tank or every single dead soldier. So we were only sort of guesstimating. And, you know, the assumption is that Ukrainian estimates are inflated in some portion. Um, although though maybe, maybe not usually, mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of what's been going on in the Russian economy as well, like with, we have less and less visibility on what's going on in that country, you know, with each information channel that gets shut down. So, but is it, is it possible that there is, there is a lot worse stuff going on in both the military and the economic side where that, that humiliation might actually be acceptable or better than complete military and economic collapse? Right. So this is, uh, we might be in the gambling for resurrection stage here, uh, wherein Putin has a really clear choice. You can basically, let's assume for, for argument's sake, that this is sincere. The Russians came to a deal that they believe that their boss is going to accept sincerely. And the Ukrainians believe that this is a deal that, uh, you know, their boss plus the Ukrainian people are going to be able to accept. Okay. What that suggests to us is that Putin has looked at the battlefield performance, has looked at the challenges to the Russian economy and believes that his power is better preserved by basically taking the army out of the field and ensuring that the society is locked down for as long as it needs to be in order to ensure that the economic challenges, the social challenges, um, et cetera, uh, do not actually disturb the elite that help keep him in power. That's if they accept the deal. If they don't accept the deal, then what we can see is that this quest for great powerness in terms of being able to break Ukraine in a sufficient enough manner that it shows that the United States was not able to save Ukraine at the costs that were acceptable to the US, that that is what Russia is able to do. And so having these relatively plausible peace deals help clarify basically where Putin is in terms of deciding what's more important, the great power status or essentially bolting down the domestic society. Now, my personal belief is this great powerness, that's what motivated this from the get-go, and that in essence, 
Ukraine's continued ability to stand on its feet, that's the real challenge to him. Uh, and so long as that's true, then basically whatever sort of peace deal or anything like that is tactical at best until Russia can regroup and really try to go for, you know, in effect, the third Ukrainian war, whether it's, you know, hot on the heels of this one or after some period of time where they sort of reevaluate and try to figure out how can we be more violent, more quickly um, and more efficiently so that we don't get involved in any sort of war of attrition in, um, in, a, in a neighboring land. Yeah, that's uh, that's a a challenging calculus that I would not want to try and crunch the numbers on right now, um, because as as you've mentioned in, in past episodes here, uh, there's only more stuff going into Ukraine right now. You know, I mean, you know, in, in terms of the manpower they have to shoot that stuff, it's taking losses as well as the Russians are. Uh, sure. But they at least have more things coming in to replace weapons expenditures, whereas Russia's just not. Um, right. So I, I guess that we, we can probably leave this for a future discussion, but I guess this opens up questions of, you know, even if there was a tactical pause, is there any realistic resurrection capability that Putin would have, you know, if Ukraine is still going to get armaments, if, if his army has just been, you know, bloodied, they can't build new equipment to replace the stuff they've lost because right. tanks are just still there, still blocking all the parts and, and materials they would need to rebuild that stuff, you know. The you know, does that mean that a third Ukrainian war, if it happened, would be with with different unconventional weapons? Um, because his conventional forces have been just wrecked. Um, right. So it's again, as you put it, with the sanctions and the state of the Russian economy, that's only going in one direction, and it's not up. So to the extent that Putin wants, I would suggest that he wants to win and has to be within the next cycle, you know, the next quarter, because only bad things are happening. And the amount of confidence in him by different parts of society is only going to go down because obviously at a certain point right now, the Ukrainians are, you know, whatever their successes or failures on the battlefield, the information narrative is definitely in their favor. And so this is only, and so obviously for like the Russian people, once they start to realize like their sons, their brothers, their dads, like are not coming home or are coming home in bad shape, they're going to want to win against the Ukrainians as well. Because, you know, people don't want all of this to be in vain. They want their country yeah. to have been in the right. And so between the people, the Russian people wanting victory, the Russian economy, like heading due south, and the conventional forces being unable to affect positive battlefield outcomes, it sort of narrows the things that Putin can do to turn this around. And of course, using unconventional weapons might lose what's uh, what's left of uh, international support from places like uh, China, India, and and other such states. Yeah. So at, actually, talking about that that cycle coming up, I don't want to keep you here too much longer, but. We are what we're three, four days away from the next, the next draft class for the Russian army. Yeah. Um, so I, if you want to maybe give me like a, you know, a 10 second hot take on how do you think that draft class is going to go? Um, and are there any indications that the current class of conscripts is going to be held on to or extended? Um, and, and what, what, what implications might that have to that? that Russian, you know, the, 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 the perspective or the opinion of the Russian people when, you know, basically these conscripts who are not supposed to be there anyway, right now, they're not, now they've, the time when they're coming back has been, is even further in the distance, raising uncertainty, whether they're coming back, you know, with their shield or on their shield, that thing. Right. Right. So the, the two things that we can sort of uh, keep in mind for, you know, perhaps like the next episode or the episode after that is every every con conscript class is marked by pretty substantial evasion. Um, because in the days of yore, and this is what has changed, is if you were gonna get that summons for your, your conscript to, to like go to the local uh, military uh, commissariat, um, 
it would just get mailed. And if you weren't at home or you were in a different city, then you wouldn't get it. So in the last couple of weeks, the Russians have the Russian parliament passed a law that made this mailing of that summons done by registered mail. So if so, like when the postman or the letter carrier, uh, use a contemporary phrase, when a letter carrier comes to the house with that thing, if you're not there, there's going to be another adult over the age of 18 who will sign it for you. And accepting that piece of registered mail will then remove, in essence, the uh, plausible excuse that you didn't receive that uh, that summons. So I think, one, we will see um, much more in the way of stop loss of people being forced to sign professional terms in order to professional contracts in order to extend their time um, in the military. And then two, depending on uh, how much evasion there is, the, the Russian police and sort of in the, the various intelligence agencies will have a new tool to basically go after anyone who is 18 to, to 60 years old. And so there might be more evasion than before, but the government has more tools in order to, you know, in effect, press gang people um, into military service. Yeah, and uh, well, we can leave this for another day because I know we're we're getting late into the evening here. But it'd be interesting to know uh, down once we sort of get to that point, maybe get a sense of evasion or not evasion. Maybe get your take on uh, just how much police power Putin has left to go around. Because you know, do you go after the draft dodgers or do you go after the protesters? And and I'm guessing there's you know there's not enough Rose Guardia for everybody. Is that the right term? Is that the internal? Yeah, so they have several. So, I mean, it's like, when do you have like, like multiple federal level agencies uh, for regime stability? Like that sort of indicates like where you find the concern. Um, like as uh, Bertolt Brecht uh, mentioned, or someone mentioned to me in a uh, conversation the other day, he had this sort of joke or line in one of his poems. Um, the people have been dissolved and a new people will be elected. Yes. So like that's a level of sort of popular uh, interaction that's going on so far. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we'll uh, see how uh, how many more jail cells they have until they need to, to build some more. Although if everyone's in prison, who's going to build any jails? I don't know. You know, when, you know, I think one of the key things, perhaps maybe we can leave this on, is if you look at military service, not as a calling, but as punishment, then you have a sort of a different sense of like how enthusiastic people are uh, to join up. And that sort of should help explain, you know, some of the key differences between Russian and other militaries. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. We Maybe we can do a separate one on Russian military culture too down the road or, you know, or whatever's left of Russian military culture when this war is over. Um, yeah, so, uh, all right, Dr. Weber, thank you very much again for your time. Um, have a good evening. And uh, um, I'll leave a quick note here for the rest of our Team Krulak audience. We'll be doing a, uh, a new broadcast later on this week on uh, Thursday, March 31st at 10 o'clock. We're going to have a, uh, a panel of Team Krulak fellows and representatives from the Air Force Cyber College, as well as Columbia University. And we're going to talk about the, uh, or they're going to talk about, moderated by uh, Dr. Brandon Lariano, who's another one of our Kulak Center Distinguished Fellows, as Dr. Weber is. Uh, but looking at lessons for cyber strategy after the Ukraine war, it should be a very interesting discussion because cyber or the lack or the perspective of a lack of cyber in some realms that was expected has definitely been a hot topic of conversation as the war has unfolded. So our panel is going to uh, going to unpack that and see what lessons we can take from uh, both sides for U.S. cyber strategy going forward. So we have that to look forward to on Thursday. And then uh, we'll get back here with Dr. Weber here as well in the near future for a future episode of Down the Rabbit Hole. So Dr. Weber, again, thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you.